So tell me how you got started in uh, the film industry or in cinematography per se. What what piqued your interest? Um, I guess from early age. Well, my mother was a still photographer. Okay. I grew up with cameras and dark room in my house and always, always with photography, you know, and a camera on my hands. And um, but eventually, when I was around eleven, I I bought my Super Eight camera. And I just kind of like started doing, you know, same photography, but in motion. So that's kind of, that was kind of like my start. Um, and then I went to, you know, I went to film school in Mexico City. Um, I studied there and then I just kind of like continue up with, with the career, you know. Sure. And what was uh, about the work that your mom did? that inspired you more than just having a camera in the house? Like, was there a certain photograph or was there a certain story that she was trying to tell using the photo medium that somehow spoke to you at a very deep level? Well, it's funny. Um, I, I guess the first recollection I have, we were living in England that year when I bought my camera. Mm -hmm. And she started doing a series of photographs with, like, food... Um, what as uh, soles, you know, the ones you put inside shoes. And she was doing sure. a series of like, kind of like steps walking in different directions. And so I, funny enough, I got, I, I imitated her and I got the same things, but I animated them. So I guess I kind of like started with animating those soles and up through the house, you know, I would place them on the floor, on the floor and the walls and the ceiling. And I was kind of like follow them as they would walk around the house. So um, I guess that's that's how it uh, it all started. I guess you know. And when you say animated, was it like more through through still photographs, animation, like stop motion? No, I'm not it... doing stop like stop motion animation with the Super 8 camera. Yeah, stop right. uh, stop motion. Yeah, yeah. Like the yeah. old style, the old the old way. Oh no, I know, I know. I I've used 16 and Super 8, but mostly I've used 16 millimeter, uh, uh -huh. not Super 8 as much. But having said that. When you were first, and I'm asking you this because I went through this myself, and I'm sure everyone does, um, unless I am in uh, one odd piece, is that when you first grab the camera, right? Like in those, it's not digital. You don't know what you're shooting. You don't know if it's underexposed. You don't know if it's overexposed and all that fun and stuff. Did you, the first time you start filming, whatever that was, did that happen to you? Like, did you go through any of oh, those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, with with uh, Super 8 and, and 8 millimeter and all that, when I started, of course, everything was um, out of focus or over underexposed or overexposed. I didn't know how to use it. You know, most of those cameras started having like um, um, automized uh, uh, light meter in the camera. So that would oh, give right. you a, yes. a guide. But it was, I wasn't totally into that myself. I mean, when I was starting like, I didn't know how it really worked, you know, specifically. But so, yeah, I had all this. I had to learn the way of getting a, a roll of like Super A completely overexposed, you know, and then it's like, oh, what did I do wrong? So, yeah, we all went to that. Yeah. <laughs> and processing film um, in the 90s was super expensive. I mean, I can even imagine the time when you were going through like how how was that in terms of getting a process for the heck, you know, for, for the fun of it, like. You know, from your stand, your your mom understood you because of her 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 love for photography, or. But the, I mean, it wasn't extremely expensive. It was consumers, um, consumer cameras. The super eight cameras were super. You know, it, it was like it was, it was like having an insta, insta uh, and what was that instamatic Kodak camera? I mean, you would just sell, you know, oh, you okay. would send your roll to develop, and they would then you get your film back. It was it was like every that was like the way it used to be back then without you know, all the phones or anything you would send your film to develop and then you would bring get it back you know yeah the reason the reason i asked was because when i was in um, school in the early 2000s i was i was taking a couple of film courses and we were shooting on uh, 16 millimeter and to shoot i think it was 100 feet the the black and white film roll it was itself 25 bucks and to process it was another $25 or $30. So were you shooting on 100 feet or more than that or less than that? But this is, I mean, I guess you're not as old as I am, but Super <laughs> 8 
was a cartridge that you would buy, oh, you stick it in the camera, you send it to develop. It's and not 16 it. millimeter. No, 16 yeah. millimeter is a different story. Super 8 was a tiny little film, and then you would get it on a cartridge, you would stick it in the camera, you would shoot it, and then you would send it, and you'd get it developed, and you would get your roll back. It was this big. And how, how much could you shoot on that cartridge? Mm, I don't know. I guess it was like three, four, maybe five minutes. Okay. Maybe a bit more. I can't remember. Right. And how, how, and how did you, because there was no audio p component to those cameras, right? Like it's, it's just... Eventually there were. Like le the latest Super 8 cameras have magnetic sound. What year so, was that? Hmm. Gosh, I guess in the 70s. Okay, so they did have sound in the 70s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in the okay. 70s. Yeah, we would have um, like film, you know, the Super 8 cameras, film, uh, cameras. I had an Elmig. I, I think it was the, the, the brand. It was Japanese. And it had, you know, you could buy uh, rolls with sound. So that was not an issue. And it was, uh, it's a, it was a magnetic uh, band on the film. Yeah. Right. And when you started pursuing that career towards the film world, was it, did you always know it was cinematography or was it kind of shift and back between directing or editing? Uh, no, it was pretty much always with a camera. Uh, I mean, I've had an interest maybe in directing one day, but I've mostly been with the camera and behind the camera. Yeah, from, from the beginning and throughout school as well. Yeah, except for when I did in school my two or three films that I did in school that, that I directed, but yeah. yeah, but I was mostly always behind the camera. And what was the project or a gig or something that gave you that break to be able to do it more than a student film or you know, where you're getting paid for it? It doesn't have to be like you know major Hollywood project, but just where you're getting paid for your first project. Well, I, f I went to film school mm -hmm. um, and I started uh, the director of, the sc of my school, Eduardo Maldonado. He was a documentarist okay. and he was shooting a documentary. And one of our cinematography teachers, Santiago, was shooting it. So he brought me along as his assistant yeah. uh, on that project. And that's how I kind of like started, um, not professionally, but yeah, I started working on the business. And through Santiago, this, this teacher of mine, um, you know, I started working with him quite a bit. He is the one who um, pushed me to get into the union, which at, those, at that time in the 80s, early 80s, um, it was very hard to get into the union the same way it was here and in every other country where, you know, the old folks didn't want to let young generations come in and take their jobs. So it was all very, very controlled but i was able to go in and that's how i can how i can you know how i kind of started um and eventually our film school had a uh, a graduate student program where the the, the school uh, produces a, a feature film by a graduate student every year and so i was um lucky enough to do the second one in the program with carlos carrera another friend from school and so that was my, my first feature film um, that I shot when I was, when was this, in 1989, I guess. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was the beginning. I mean, after, that, after I shot that film, which got a bunch of awards around the world, it was a tiny little movie, but it was very successful. Um, mm. And then I, that's when I decided to, to stop assisting camera and becoming a cinematographer. So I, I quit taking any job, all the jobs that I had as a focus puller. And I was just pursuing my career, whether it was as an operator or a cinematographer. And if, of course, the first few months, um, it took, uh, you know, it wasn't immediate, you know, but little by little, I started getting like, mostly like promos and commercials and, you know, little commercials and stuff like that, where they started giving me the chance to shoot. And that's how I, you know, started the long nice. path. Yeah. 
Nice. And you worked on uh, as an assistant cameraman on Total Recall, right? I was, yes. How was that experience? And what does for, um, first assistant cameraman, I mean, uh, for the audience, what would that person do and what was your role? But go ahead. Well, first, I, I first, uh, I was trying to, uh, to go into that film as a, as a focus puller, but I didn't get it originally. I, I, they offered me the job as a second camera assistant. Um, the cinematographer who is Jos Vacano and his, at the time, wife or partner, Annette, she was the first assistant and I became her assistant. But eventually, like a month into the shooting, she became the operator and I, they moved me up for, to focus pulling. I mean, basically, the, what, a, what a first assistant does was is um, on set, takes care of uh, doing the focus. So you are next to the camera and you're checking the distances from the camera to the subject and you're focusing the lens according to the movements of the camera or the actor, actress. And so that's your job. And it's, it's a very demanding um, mm. to do and it's hard to do, but it's very fun to do as well. Cause then you, you know, you, you train your, your eyes and your mind to like know exactly what distance there is between you and that person. And, and you have to guess and you have to be, sh you know, fast with your arm and with your hand and to be able to get it right now. So that's, that's the important part of it as an assistant. The other part of it is, you're kind of like the, the one in charge in the camera truck where you need to know, you know, everything about the equipment and you take care of everybody under you, like all the other assistants and loaders and everybody else. Um, so your job is to have organized, you know, have all the equipment organized or have, you know, special equipment come in for a special day or, you know, everything that has to be with, with the logistics of the equipment. So. You know, it's amazing that, I always find that the job of a focus puller is probably one of the most underrated jobs. And it's such a, and you mentioned it just the way you did, it's such a difficult job, and especially in, in a very fast paced action sequence, right? Uh, when you're, when, especially when the camera is moving really, really fast, to be able to do all that with the movement of the action it is quite challenging and it's very demanding. And I wish there was some sort of specific award for that because I, I genuinely feel that is one of the toughest jobs on the film sets. I don't know how you feel about that. Yes, of course. Um, I actually, you know, I was focus puller before digital. So I used to pull focus next to the camera, next to the operator. And it's something that I always push for assistants to do. But I think I lost the battle because nowadays everybody pulls from a, from a monitor and from a position away from the camera. So... It's really hard to like, I, I don't understand how that, I mean, of course you have all the technology to do that, but if you're next to the camera and you're pulling from the camera, you feel the motion, you, you feel when the camera moves, you feel when the actor moves, you know the distance that is in that space and you know how to react to that. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, I lost that battle. Like I wish assistants were always again, back closer to the operator and to the camera. Uh, but yeah, so it's a very, very difficult, task and kind of fast forward to uh, monster house right uh, i mean it's a very different film and and it's a major film like you know you have people like steven spielberg and robert zemeckis uh, sony and all these big names attached to it how did you land that job um i knew the the producer jason clark and he invited me to have a meeting with Gil Cannon, the director, mm -hmm. first time director. Um, and I kind of like, I like the idea of uh, trying a virtual way of movie making. Um, and especially with that technology used on that movie, which is no longer used anymore, but something that Zemeck has explored quite a bit, which was uh, doing um, motion capture and then animating towards that information, digital information. Um, I mean, it's still a technology that is used a lot in special effects nowadays, but not as in animation as we did back then. But um, but that's the way. That's how I landed on that film. And you know, it was a process of for me. It was only like ten months, but um, for them it was years. But um, um, 
but anyway, that was, I'll, I'll let you ask something else, but that, that's pretty much how yeah. I ended up in that, in that project. And then how is that different? I mean, because motion capture is used in even an avatar, or avatar, the, the new one, right? The way of the water. And how is that different Monster House? And I get it, like the visual animation is like very, you know, like kids friendly animation as opposed to avatar is completely photorealistic. What's the difference technically if, if well, you... Now that you say it, I mean, I guess there's no difference. It's exactly the same thing, except for not on an... I, I, guess, I guess you can try... I, I think you... I guess you can say that um, Avatar is an animation. If you treat it that way, then then it's exactly the same technology. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, now that I realize that, as I'm saying it now, that uh, what I'm saying is like in traditional animations, they don't use that technology anymore. They just yeah. do it the, the the old you know the 3D way that they use um, before. But um, yeah, it is exactly the same technology as in Avatar, where you have a um, a virtual space with all the cameras capturing the motion of the actors and the performances, the, the sound. Yep. And then that is applied to, in our case, you know, I guess it's the same in Avatar. They, after we did the whole recording of the, the um, motion capture for the whole film, all the scenes of the film, that information is, is uh, translated into 3D models and then applied to 3D um, figures of the characters on a very like um, basic way. No, they're not by any means developed characters. Just like they give you the the shape, so you know what figure is what character. Uh, and so then you start playing with cameras and all that afterwards. Um, but it's kind of like the same. It's exactly the same technology, I would say. Yeah. yeah. And how was that process? Because you know you're in this warehouse of a room where everybody's run, running around with all these dots on their body. I mean, yeah, the performances are there. It's the same thing as like a live action movie. But just yourself being in that environment where there's not actual real sets or real wardrobes or, you know what I mean? Like, how how was that for you? Or was it like a very seamless transition? No, I mean, it's, well, the first, first is to understand that the process of Monster House um, is exactly the process of a live action movie. You do exactly the same steps, only yep. in different order. Yeah. For example, like in a regular movie, you you um you know you have the script, you 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 rehearse. Well, you have wardrobe. Uh, do the wardrobe. You have production designers do the set. You have the lighting happening. You know. Then you have the rehearsal of the actors, the blocking, and then you shoot it. In, in Monster House, the process was different. It was like, first we had the performance, then we had the camera work, then we had the, the production design and the wardrobe attached to them. Then we had, of course, all the animation. And then at the end is the lighting. So you do exactly the same processes, only different order. Mm. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to you. Um, it, it, it does, but I think what, what I'm trying to get at is um, when you are on the, in that physical location, right? Like, I, I, I get it, like, everything is the same, but it's not, it, it's just being in that, because you have shot all these films, it, it came out in 2006, so I imagine it started production in 2004, 2003, and you've got, like, you know, 13, 14 years of experience of filming live action movies. Right, which again, it's not much different from what you did, but just being thrown in that environment where you're just in one room, right, and you're just following actors or doing coverage and all that stuff, was that very easy to adapt to, or was that just something difficult? I, I mean, well, the the adaptation to that was now that I said this about this, the the way things are organized and yeah. worked out, when you are there. In the in the virtual space, which was like a square, twenty by twenty square, yep. surrounded with a structure of three hundred cameras, infrared cameras to capture the motion of these dots. Um, first of all, just imagine for a computer that is processing all that information, you only have dots in space. You don't have an image. You don't know what the character is doing or anything. So, in order to have that information next to your computer information, we had to shoot 
that see the, the scenes with video cameras as video references so that the animators later on had a, a visual um, reference to what the actor was doing or acting or, if, mm -hmm. or what gesture he was doing or she was doing, you know? So, and also we, is that when we were planning the, 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 the blocking of the actors, on mm -hmm. that space, the director and I, we were thinking of it as from the camera perspective. So that's what I had to ad adjust to this system where, okay, let's see that in the future when we do the, the cameras on the computer, imagine right. that the camera is going to be on this angle. So let's have the actors move in this sequence or in this way so that it had um, sense the motion of the actors had sense towards a point of view of a camera otherwise you're just doing a play yeah you know everything has to have a perspective you have to think where the camera is and what the camera is going to see when you apply it later on in the process so then for example if you think you're going to put a camera here and then i would put a big a video camera there to have that reference you know mm -hmm. um and so the actors would move around uh, not completely they had to like follow what those cameras were doing because those are ju just references but in a way the blocking and everything in the in in the set was uh being um, thought out from a camera perspective if that mm. makes sense yeah i mean I, i've seen a lot of behind the scenes stuff of monster house and of avatar and all that stuff but i was just trying to understand you know how difficult the transition is if it isn't but it seems like i think you from from what you're saying you kind of you know adapted pretty quickly it's like you know it's like everything like you know you, you don't you don't you haven't done it but as soon as you start doing it you start kind of like figuring figuring it out yeah and so but it, it just kind of like it's very organic what you need to do like it's not a big uh yeah, it's different. You know, after after ten months of being in Monster House, I did um, want to go back to a real set with actors and lights. You know, after that experience, but you know, by doing it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like a big adjustment to do something like that. It's just once you understand the technology and the te the technique, it's very easy to just follow. You know, right, right. And what was the uh, the most challenging? Do you remember anything that happened on the set? any of the scenes or some techno technological barrier that you had to come over? What was that and how did you overcome that? Or any fond memory, it doesn't even have to be a challenge. Well, I mean, as I say, like the first, the first step was to do the, the motion capture and that, right. that took us like seven or eight weeks. And then we stopped while at Sony, uh, they were processing all that information and, com and conforming the, the 3D models. And once they were conformed, I came back to do the to work on the computers now directly to put cameras and to do all the angles and do all the you know. So learning that process was also interesting in terms of you know a camera on a computer is a dot, so you can put the camera anywhere you want. Yeah, there's no volume or there's no limitations of where you can put the camera or how fast or how or what lens you can you what you can use you can do anything with it you know so learning that was interesting but also like for example like you're talking about coordinates with with a camera the way it moves if it's a dolly move or a pan or a or a crane you know and so a computer will just gonna if you say go from a to b this is going to do like a, like a mechanical move. So, and I didn't want, I wanted the camera to have a bit of like a softness to it. Like, so I was always asking the computer guys to like, at the end of the curve, when the camera came to stop, like do like a softener, I would say like, just kind of like let the camera come, you know, um, to a, to a, to stop with, with grace, not just like a bump, you know? Yeah things like that. Or one day, I remember one time we were looking for um, like a handheld effect. Okay. Um, so I had the idea and I said to the guys, why don't you attach the camera to, to one of the characters and then play the scene? And so now the camera is attached to the character. When you play, the camera moves with the actor like that. And so you get a, a handheld mm -hmm. camera virtually. 
So that was a good um, discovery. So playing with all these possibilities of how yeah. to move the camera around with, using that technology. And, you know, as you start playing with it, you get, you know, all these fun ways of doing it. And do you think having that ability to put a camera wherever, you know, you want and move it the way you want it in terms of speed and angle, you think that's a curse or it's a blessing as a cinematographer? It's, you know, I, of course, we did things that you can't really do on real life, but I was yeah. trying to stay as grounded as possible. And I said that Good. to the field director, I said like, not just because we can move the camera in every direction and in every possible way, we should. I mean, we also have to tell, tell a story and we need to know, you know, find the right style of movement or where the camera has to be. Like you're, like you're shooting a regular film, no? Yeah. But of course, when you have the possibility of like, you know, like there's a shot where we start really close on, on Chowder and this character, like, on a really, really, really long zoom. And then the camera mm -hmm. zooms back to like a super wide angle. I mean, there's no lens on earth that you can do that. Like we went from like a, yeah. a thousand millimeter to a 17 I remember. in one shot. Yeah. So that's something that you can't do with, with the real, with the existing equipment that you can do on a computer, you know? And I think those kind of movements really did well and played well for the type of genre of the film it was, right? Like the scary, element and the music and the sound effects with the movement of the camera and everything so that that yeah. that worked out really really well and working with the director um the first time director gil renan renan is it how you pronounce it renan Kenan. renan Gil Kenan. how was how was it working with him considering it was his first film and you were doing your first like you know motion capture per se well he's he's very clear on what he wants and you know by by saying First time director, I don't mean to say that he didn't know what he was doing. He no, no, I know, I know what he was doing. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it was a lot of like talking together. Like the, he, he had like uh, things very, already very well visualized. Like for example, the beginning shot where, where the camera follows the lead. Yep. That was something that he had been working on. Like he wanted that shot specifically. So there was, there was, um, there was clear ideas. He had clear ideas of what, how he wanted to see things. And then I came in kind of like helping out in terms of um, help, helping him like choose the right angle for the scene in terms of like of the drama of the scene happening, whether the camera was moving around or, you know, or moving in with the actors or, you know, kind of like the actual language of it, you know. But he had a very clear ideas as well. It was a, it was a really cool collaboration with him right and was there any time that as a or spielberg popped in on the set no not really they're just executive producers yeah so uh, maybe didn't... maybe zemeckis once you know stopped by at the at sony studios when we were working on it but yeah not much right and then once the motion capturing is done and the camera angles and all that stuff is done in terms of the actual the feel of the characters, how they look in the final output, right? The way they turned out in the final film. Um, do you, as a cinematographer in that kind of a project, do you have any say in that? Or is that just more of like the animation slash director department? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I had nothing to do with it. Um, I had certain um, things to say about the lighting, but not even, I mean, all the lighting and all the design of the ins, you know of the the show the the film itself is done by the the visual effects guys the animators yeah so you didn't see the film in the final as until it was finally completed basically well, I, yeah i saw you know with kill I, I saw you know once it was what we did on the computer we saw that put together as a film because the editing is happening as you're doing those shots and then actually you know if, if we did a shot in the, we, we had like seven, I guess, um, five or seven uh, computer artists. And so one, each one of them was working on a different uh, scene. Mm -hmm. And when those um, shots were rendered, they were sent to the editing room. And so the editor would put them together and then he would send those notes to do modifications. Um, so that's also part of the, also different way of processing where the editing is happening before 
the rest of before even the wardrobe or the lighting is happening. So the editing, because you want to have the, the film edited on a very rough way before you start doing all the fine tuning. Otherwise, it yeah. would be stupid and expensive. Wasted so time. so then um, um yeah, so then we would do um you know, we would see the film uh, finalized as that, as yeah. you know, that process. And then I saw eventually other stages of the process before it was fully finished. Yeah. Right, right. And since then, um, obviously, you know, you've done so many other projects and so many other films. Have you had the desire or have you had the opportunity to revisit anything like that again? Like, have you been offered or has that been the sort of... Cabins, and I would love to. I would love to do another one. Yeah, I think it's, there's a bunch of really fun uh, things you can do with it, um, with this technology. So I would be really happy to do it again. Maybe you should knock on James Cameron's door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got four in the works, three in the works or four, something like that. I think Avatar 2, uh, 3, four. He did already two and three. Yeah, four is, four is half done. Is it? Uh -huh. Yeah, four is half done, at least production-wise. Um, uh -huh. But then I also was reading, I mean, we're just kind of going off topic. Yesterday I was reading, I don't even know if this is true, that James Cameron shot so much of Avatar 3 that there might be a nine-hour cut for Disney+. Plus. Oh, my God. I mean, that, like, it's like a miniseries almost, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any, anyways, but uh, y you have also worked on films like uh, Focus um, uh, and Enough Said and 21 Grams and Babel. Babel, I have always loved. It's one of my favorite films, but you came on as an additional cinematographer, at least with the IMDb. Scene. Just on, on 21 Grams and Babel, I just helped Rodrigo. Um, on, on 21 Grams, I helped them with second unit cinematography. And on Babel, I just helped uh, his mother passed away doing that movie. So I came in to, you know, I took over for a week while he was taking care of businesses and then he came back. So it was just okay. helping out. Yeah. Okay. And in, in Babel or 21 Grams, well, let's talk about Babel, for example. Being there in a week, were you shooting, because it had multiple story angles, right? Were you, did you just do part of one or did you do part of few? Yeah, or? they were shooting, it was a section where they were shooting in Tijuana. Okay. That story, so it was just a, 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 mo a week of work in Tijuana while well, Rodrigo was in Mexico. Yeah. And... Working with, working on, I know you didn't work on that film that much. I'm just, I'm just trying, because it's one of my favorite films, actually. Um, and I, I'll obviously have a separate episode about that with, with, the, uh, with the cinematographer of that film. But just working in that kind of a story, like, did you know the full fledge of a story, even though you were there for a week, just to give you some sort of a context? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I read, before I got there, I, I read the script and I, I knew what it was all about and, and then I went, you know, I went down and they filled me in with all the, all that Rodrigo had planned so that um, I could just follow up with his, um, you know, with what he had planned originally. Yeah. And have you had the opportunity to work? I always don't know how to pronounce his name, so forget me, forgive me. Alejandro? Alejandro? Is it Alejandro? Alejandro. Have you ever had the opportunity to work with him again? Because, I mean, he's a fabulous filmmaker. I love his work. Only those two op opportunities that I helped him out, but I haven't, I haven't done anything else with him. Yeah. I'm imagining it's something that you would like to do down the road if that opportunity presents itself. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And um, what was your work on um, um, what, what, the James Gandolfini and Julia Richard Dreyfus movie? Enough said. Enough said. Yeah. Uh, but you were a main cinematographer. Uh, how tell me just the, how you got on board on that project and the process of working on on that film that was different than Total Recall or you know Focus or the other projects that you may have worked on that at least I am familiar with. Um, well, I I met Nicole Hall of Center, the director, while shooting Enlightened, that show where she directed one of the episodes, and I met her. And we had a good uh, relation there. So she invited me to her movie. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I got into it. And, and I really love it. I mean, well, Nicole is a, such a good writer. She's written incredible scripts. And I really like this one. Um, and I'm, it's, it's a little movie that I have a lot of uh, heart uh, put in that movie. I think um, 
it's it's such a great chemistry between those two, James Gandolfini and, and Julia Louis Dreyfus. Um, and it was such a pleasant experience, you know, fun, great people to work with. Um, it was, yeah. was kind of like a little family, you know. It's one of those projects that you're really glad to be part of. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny, right, that with James Gandolfini, late James Gandolfini, he had such good chemistry with Julia Louis Dreyfus and in, in our set. But I, uh, I had recently seen The Mexican where, yeah. where she had a chemistry with... Um, it was almost identical chemistry. He was just... I, it, both films, the way his performance is, he connected to those two opposite characters so really, really well in a very genuine way. I don't even think he had to make any effort. I mean, I'm sure he did, but it just seemed like he wasn't making an effort. It just came across so naturally. He was a great actor. He was a fabulous. Yeah, actor. he was. He was not just a great actor. He was a great, fantastic guy. It was. It was I, a shame I've heard that, yeah. that he died. Uh, he was fantastic. It was so easy to work with him and so fun. He was very, you know, dedicated to his job. Like he, he was sensitive to like distractions and stuff. So he was very, very concentrated always on his, on his doing. But um, it was a shame that we were finishing the movie when he died. So. Uh, I think even Nicole offered to see him to see the movie and he said, right, you know, before he died, of course. And, and he said like, no, no, I don't want to see myself being a, be a good guy. He was, he was not, uh, he was, sh I, I guess he, there was some sort of like shame on his side that he didn't want to see himself being like a softy mm -hmm. or something. <laughs> so he didn't get to see the film. Finished. Uh, uh, unless that character, unless the character he played in Sopranos always lives with him, right? So, <laughs> complete opposite of. You know, it was funny. Like when we started the movie, I, I, I did call him a few times. I said Tony instead of Jim. Like yeah. <laughs> Tony, I was, I was like, I'm sorry, 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 Jim. And he's like, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's hard to take <laughs> that character, you know, away from him. Yeah, and and. When you are when you are offered a film, right? Um, it's different with a director. Um, maybe it's the same thing with a cinematographer. Do you basically pick based on something that speaks to you, or is it a genre, or is it the story, or is it the character? Like, is there any kind of process, or is it just one of those things? Okay, I'm done with this job. On to the next one, kind of thing. Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes I've had to like you know, take jobs, you know, some you of them are great. Right. Some, there's a, a couple there that I don't want to mention, but, um, that's okay. But mostly what I, what I like, uh, that I've been fortunate enough to do is that I have a, like a, a range of different movies all across. Like, I don't, I don't feel that all my movies look like it, like they don't move, they don't look alike. Um, they're all different. Mm -hmm. And so I've been, I'd love to explore more like horror and stuff like that, but um, which I've done, like did, I did that show then for Amazon, um, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, which one is so that? So, them. Them, I haven't seen it. I have to take a look into that. Yeah. Okay. It's a mini series or like a seasonal show? Yeah, it's, it's a season. They're, they're shooting or they just finished shooting the second season. It's a first season, 10 episodes. Um, okay. It's like a period piece of uh, an African-American family in the 50s that moves into a white neighborhood in California, Los Angeles, well, in Compton. That sounds so familiar. I may have seen the trailer for it. Um, okay. But anyway, so it's, yeah, it's fun to be able to, to work in different genres, you know, and, and, and just explore different ways of telling stories. Um, yeah. You know, there's creativity in every possible um, uh, type of movie, you know, like from yeah. I Love It, Philip Morris, uh, that is kind of like a comedy, but with a twist as well. So there, there was a bunch of opportunities to do fun stuff there too. Um, or like Watchmen, which is kind of like science fiction, comic book, uh, which has a completely different look to things, to like an offset that is just a, you know, like a dramedy what what is i don't know what that movie is um you know it's a, a story <laughs> of the right word a story of you know two guys two people in love you know so yeah yeah, yeah and and I, I don't want any names or anything but you mentioned 
we all we all have projects that we work on that you know you just get on and then you realize you know oh not really enjoying it but you know you have to pay the bills too right whenever you're in that kind of a project and especially and again I don't want to know any names if it's like a six month project or a five month project and you realize in the first month that I got into this and I shouldn't have but yeah you need the money how do you is it is it the factor of like financial reason that motivates you just to kind of keep going or how do you overcome that thing that where you're not really enjoying it but you have to do it well like being responsible of your work and sometimes you know i i've learned that the same way you can be fired from a project you can also say no to a project yeah. so I've learned uh, that if you're not happy doing a project, that you can also speak out and say, you know what, this is not working out. Why don't we make a change, get somebody else and finish the project and I move out. So, you know, we, have, we all have the possibility of doing that, no? It's, it's mm -hmm. also a choice. And if things, you know, not everybody that you work with, you connect. You yeah. think you are connected and then suddenly things are not the way they were meant to be or or you're not or there's no chemistry between members of the crew and yourself and so it's better to just call it off and i don't think there's any anything wrong with it so if it's not working i think we all need to learn that there's a possibility of saying no and saying with the most you know kind way just say you know what this is not working let's let's change it and there shouldn't be any problem and you're right about that but my my question to that would be do you th because the industry is so big but it's so small right like the word of mouth travels very quickly and that's how you get projects like you know like you said you were working with somebody and and so on and so forth but if you walk and not you anybody that walks out of a project in whatever position that is whether it's 10 percent in 50 percent in and even if you leave very politely do you think that people are afraid to make those decisions because it may harm them in the long term that this person walked out of the project yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah. But, you know, that, that's why I'm saying, like, I'm 58 years old, and I'm just saying that now that I learned that. I mean, like, whenever I am in a project, I always think, like, okay, I committed to this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to finish it because that's the right thing to do. But now I say, why do I need to do something I don't want to do? So, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I say this same way, like, if, if, if they can fire you, you can fire yourself too. You can also you just come and say, I don't want to do this anymore. And, you know, everybody has gone through these situations. I don't think there's anything that will stain your career, you know. It's just things that happen with humans. Like sometimes you get along, sometimes you don't get along. That shouldn't be an issue for anyone. But if things are not working for any of the parts, why force it? You know, and you're and you're right that I think as humans, even not in our industry, but in general, we try sometimes too hard to make things work with people that are not in the same you know mindset as we are, and and that puts a stress on us. And then later on, you realize that you know, and yeah, it's it's a good thing too that you have to if you get on a job one first time, maybe I mean you're realizing it now, but a lot of people who are probably not in your position, you have a very you know, successful career, they, they, they would go through it because they've given their word and they just want to go through it and deal with it. And it teaches you a lot too. And what it taught you is that it's okay to say no, right? So it, it's, it's a, it's a never-ending cycle. And a, as a cinematographer, who have you looked up to the most growing up or are you someone you still look up to or some film that you see to keep inspiring you and to keep making you move forward? I mean, I always loved uh, Nestor Almendros' work. His um, his uh, naturalistic and simple yet um, large way of shooting. Um, I always re I always uh, re um, react to his work. I I'm not familiar with him. So, what has he done? Nestor Almendros. I'm just oh trying. To... Well, you need to look him up. What, how do you spell I mean, that? He's on Nestor. Almendros. Maybe I know his work, but maybe I don't know his name. Hold on, Nestor. What what, what films has he done? Um, oh my God. 
Um, hold on a sec. Oh, he's a Spanish cinematographer. Yeah, he did all his work here in, in the States. Um, hold on. One of the most beautifully shot movies of history, Days of Heaven. He did Kramer versus Kramer, Sophie's Choice. I've seen these movies, Blake. Days of Heaven. If you haven't seen Days of Heaven, you, you've missed it all because that's the most incredibly uh, beautiful um, available light movie ever made. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a look at that because I have seen a bunch of other things that he's done, not knowing that it was his Sophie's Choice and Kramer's versus Kramer and but I, and I'm, New York Stories. He did a segment of that I've seen, but I'll take a look at Days of Heaven for sure. For yes, sure. you'll be surprised. No, I'm 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 looking forward to that. I'm just making a note of that. And is there a particular movie that you see now? before you go on set for it, before you begin work on any new film or any new series? Well, you do, you know, your regular um, research when you're starting a project, every project is different. So you, I wouldn't say I watch the same movie for all the projects, but every time you start a project, you have all these references and then you start watching the movies that you think can inspire you to what you're going to do. So yeah, there's always that, stage of research when starting a project no right and on that question you also worked on white lotus right mm -hmm. okay so that's something that isn't something i'm going to see next week but for something like that what would you what did you see to to get give you the feel of the approach that you want to make on on that show? well like the, the example that i did on on, on White Lotus, uh, we shot it in Sicily. Um, we shot in some of the locations that La Ventura from Antonioni was shot. Mm -hmm. So I watched that movie with Monica Vitti. Um, and I got inspiration to, there's even a, an homage that we did for that movie with uh, Aubrey Plaza in the city of Noto, where the original film was shot. So we did exactly the same shot as La Ventura with Monica Vitti, we rep repeated the whole thing um, as an homage to that movie and also, uh, you know, as an homage to being in Sicily. So there's always references um, and films that you yeah. get inspired from, you know, yeah. for, for a specific project. Did you ever, I'm assuming yes, but I'm just going to ask you, Sergio Leone, did you ever see his work growing up or... Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. What did you yeah. think? What do you, I mean, for me, the opening up Once Upon a Time in the um, West is like one of the most incredible pieces of cinema, like without any kind of dialogue and, you know, you're at a train station. Yes. And yeah, that always, that always uh, calls my attention. Like when you see pieces like that, where it's all about the image, not about the lines, because mostly everything now is just dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And then you just want to see something that is, a story that is told with images, not with words, you know? Yeah. But for that particular scene and that particular film, it was not just the fact that there was no lines. It was like every single shot, the lens that was used, the angle that was the camera was used, uh, positioned. It was just, and the way it was cut back and forth between the wide to a close up, you know, it was, it was yeah. beautiful. And, and you said that you eventually want to direct something, right? When you said that earlier, and you said that your mom is a, was a photographer. Is that something that something personal you want to do? Because, I mean, I see something. I'm sure there's some story there that you may have about your mom being a photographer. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it has to do with my mother, but I'm maybe just, does. Who knows? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, but you always get yeah. the ideas from personal stories, right? And you make them on your own and all that stuff. But is there yeah, something? Yeah, maybe it's a good idea. Yeah. I did actually shoot two documentaries with my mother. Um, we went to the Bering Strait uh, twice to shoot uh, two different documentaries on the Eskimos, both on the Alaska side and on the Russian side. So I did, that's, that's what I did with her. But yeah, maybe there's some other inspiration I could do based on her to do my own, my own work. What, what's, that, what's those documentaries called? One is called uh, Bering Equilibrium and Resistance. The other one is called Bering family reunion 
And they're um, the same, similar story or just uh, the name? Well, it's it's the first one is what what happened. Well, this is like eight years ago. The way that the Eskimos live in, in the tip of Alaska, in the Bering mm. Strait. And the second one was because they... There's two islands in the Strait. One is Russian, one is American. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Cold War, the Russians kind of like put a big wall, imaginary, not physical, between yeah. the islands. So he did, you know, they divided families. So they're all related. I mean, Russia and Alaska are like 50 miles apart. So yeah. um, they divided families. So the second documentary, we, we took this uh, Alaskan woman to Russia, and we were looking for her relatives. So that's how we connected the two mm. parts of it. And your mom's role was in it as a protagonist or? No, she's the director. She's the director. So you were doing the cinematography. Well, that's interesting. So how was that experience working with your mom as a? Fantastic. I mean, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you know, she, she's an artist. She was an artist, photographer. She had no experience with documentary, but you know, she, she went along and I, you know, we helped her out. Um, and you know, it worked out really well. The two films are quite interesting. I'm going to take a look at them. Do you have any story of working with her on either one of those films that remains in your mind as a good memory? Well, just the fact, you know, the fact that we were me and my brother was doing the sound. So the fact that, uh, and then besides other, you know, the producer and the people from Alaska who helped us out, but uh, just the, the, the fact of shooting something with my mother and then being in the corner of the world, you know, you know what can be better than that? You know, yeah. it, was, it was just like when we thought about it, it was like, what a gift to be able to experience this with my mother, you know, yeah. and, you know, so it's just very, very profound. You, you guys must have not that you weren't at that level before, but to be able to rebond again when you're not filming in that corner of the world where there's not much going on, right? Like you're just kind of com more or less disconnected from the world and to be able to spend that time with each other. Um, I'm sure that's something that stays with you forever. All right. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, I feel for now this is good uh, Javier I, 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 I have been meaning to watch White Lotus so once I do uh, I would love to chat with you about it in depth if that's something that you're willing to do so sure let me know uh -huh. I hope you enjoy it